welcome to Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter Comedy Actors. I'm Lacey Rose, and I'd like to welcome Dan Levy, Kumail Nanjiani, Rami Youssef, Ricky Gervais, Kenan Thompson. Let's get started. We're living through a unique time, both with the global pandemic and the social unrest. What have you all learned about yourselves during this period? <laughs> I, I prefer it, and I want it to go on forever. <laughs> Not the social unrest, the lockdown. I'm enjoying the lockdown, I mean. It suits me. I don't like people coming to the house. I, d I don't, I'm glad I'm not there in person. Um, <laughs> this is, this, I like it. I, I don't know, I mean, I just, I've been relying on myself a lot to get things like this done. I built full technological equipment type things, satellite media interfaces all this time, so. Feeling pretty smart, even though that didn't sound very smart. <laughs> <laughs> I found that I had a lot of things I didn't realize that were very important to me that were like I would do for sanity over the, you know, many decades of my life. And when they're taken away, uh, it's challenging to figure out like new stuff that makes you feel like a person. And what have you found? Well, <laughs> how are you feeling like a person? Well, I'm still working on it. <laughs> I'm still working on it. I mean, technologically speaking, I've realized that if the apocalypse were coming and technology was all that I had, I would be not good. So I'm shocked I'm here today. <laughs> I'm shocked that my computer worked. And, you know, that's that. Mm. But, you know, I do feel like this. <laughs> I do feel like, you know, we, we're in a time where uh, I think technology and I think social media have become an unbelievable resource for, for change and for information to be shared readily to, to people in ways that I think has never been available before. And I think that I'm very thankful for, for that and for the fact that, that information and that resources and that places to donate during all of this can be shared so that the kind of awareness that should have been happening a long, long time ago can finally kind of hit people. Granted, you know, it, it, it should have happened a long time ago, but I do feel like fortunately because of the, the internet and where we're at, and I think the fact that people are at home, there's almost a captive audience for people to really learn in ways that they were not learning before. You can never not be learning now. Um, and you should never have not been learning before. Um, I want to change my answer to whatever, to, to Dan's <laughs> answer. I want to change it to that. So please just credit me with that. Thank you. Rami, what about you? Have you learned anything about yourself in this period? I agree with, I mean, definitely just say no. what Dan said was great. I really <laughs> haven't learned. It's like you think you learned something and then you don't. And then you're like, no, that wasn't, that was just, uh, I was just losing my mind. I was just losing my damn mind. <laughs> and uh, I did find out that my mom um, gets her news from the internet, mostly from WhatsApp. Uh, she sent me a movie called Plandemic. She said, I have to watch it. This was all planned. So I learned a little bit of that. <laughs> no. What would you do with a gig right now? Can you find humor in this moment? Yeah. I, I, I'd have to, you, you've got to rewrite it. I was halfway through my tour so um i mean the, the annoying thing about this pandemic is that i've got to change a few lines here and there i mean that's what <laughs> with i think the world to take away i mean but the, the good thing as we said but the good thing about the internet is this will allow like those nurses that are doing 14 hour shifts some of them dying it allow them to see us talk about our shows that might get nominated for an emmy <laughs> so there's that so there's that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it swings and roundabouts, always. <laughs> Rami, what about you? Yeah, you, I mean, you could, but uh, I don't know that that's really what's on my mind. I mean, I think even speaking to some of what Dan was saying, I think there's value in some ways in there not being a, a ton of distractions right now as we kind of figure out what's going on in our country. And, and you kind of look at the, the positives that are coming out of it. So, I mean, it, yeah, I could, I could do some stand-up, but it, it's, it's not really like what, what's on my mind right now. Keenan, I'm curious, are, are you sort of thinking, thank God we don't have to do an episode of SNL right now, or are you thinking conversely, too bad we're dark because we could really lift people up in this moment? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the responsibility of doing comedy is to make people try to feel good through bad times, but it is definitely very tiptoe-ish at the moment, so it, it might be a little harder than, you know, 
it would be funny. So I don't even know if the point of doing it would be worth it, you know, if it's not going to be funny because everybody's so sensitive about everything right now. That's the best time. When yeah, everyone's right? on edge and everyone's sensitive, that's the best time to be right? insensitive. My show was packed with jokes about AIDS, cancer, famine, the Holocaust. This is just going to top it up. I'm glad this helps Ricky's brand. Exactly, it's helping. <laughs> this is Ricky's prime time right now. <laughs> Do you ever get nervous, Ricky? Uh, um, I don't know. I have, I have some anxiety dreams, but I don't know if they're nervous or not. What are your anxiety dreams? Well, I'm on, a, I'm on a train and I'm going in and out of a tunnel and my dad spills milk all over my face. <laughs> you sure that's milk? <laughs> that's, that's not true. That's not true. I just made that up. Who wants to dissect You that? just lied to us about a dream you had? Uh. <laughs> I'm anxious right now, if I'm being honest. Are you? What are you anxious about, Dan? <laughs> Rami, I want to go back to, uh, to Golden Globe night which you had a look of sort of genuine shock on your face as you were winning with this award. You've since said that you knew as Jennifer Aniston was opening that envelope that you had won. Is that right? Yeah, I could, I could see she was like, what is this name? Like she very much had no idea how to pronounce what was happening. And, and it was like the, she had the substitute teacher look where she was like, I don't, what is this? Uh, and so that was, that was very exciting. And, uh, and actually, Ricky was a big part of it for me, too, because he said, get up and thank your God. And I was like, actually, I'm, I will. And so I just I feel like that was our first time working together, man. It was very fun. So by calling your show Rami, you get, as you've put it, quote, the brunt of everything, the praise, the death threats, the condemnations to hell. So first, what's the breakdown? What's what's the split between those? Um, you don't know. It's, it's kind of like one of those things that could happen. Um, like, like the likelihood of an Emmy or a fatwa is pretty equal and you're kind of like, maybe I'm in the running, maybe I'm not. Uh, you just kind of like wait and see what, what happens. But we definitely hear the uh, all sides of things with, with something that's talking about, you know, God and talking about Muslims in a way that, that gets, uh, you know, it, they're emotional topics, but we try and go at them the, the best way that we can. What's been the response you sort of least expected? Just people who uh, don't fit the exact specifications of the family feeling really connected. Like I got an email from a guy who was like, I'm an evangelical Christian father of three and I'm Rami. And, and that you get something like that and, and that feels really, uh, I was like, yeah, I, I didn't know that, that you were. And it's really cool to just see it connecting with, with different people. Sure. What about the rest of you guys? What, what are the sort of responses that, that come at you with the shows that you guys are making that you perhaps don't expect at all. Mine was the emotional response. I was surprised people would come up to me, they'd tell me their story of grief. And nearly everyone that came up to me said, oh, oh, I lost my sister three weeks before I watched the show, or I lost my wife last year. And it was amazing that they would say that to a stranger because they, they sort of used the show as an in. And they said, oh, and I was, I was Tony. That was me for a year. So that was, that was mm. quite a shock. It affects you because I've, I, it made me want to treat that responsibly in series two, so I didn't make him get better. Because you don't, you don't snap out of depression. It's almost interactive, because I'm on Twitter and mm. Facebook, and it's on Netflix, so it's there all the time. There's a lot more feedback than ever before. So um, it, does, it does sort of affect you. Uh, and the things that affect you is when a real person comes up to you and tells you it affected their actual life. Has any of that happened after season two and then now as you're thinking about a season three uh yeah um well season two it was it was the same really you, you get feedback from um social workers and people saying they're using the show in grief and again it's sort of scary to have a responsibility as a comedian because it's it's not good it's not good <laughs> to have a responsibility as a comedian um but you, as a as a person you do you know, you do, you do worry. It, it's good and bad. It's good and bad. You can't, not, you can't detach yourself from the world as much as I'd like to. Um, so you just try and, make, you try and make bad things funny. That's all. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think any time you tell stories that are, are not part of the mainstream narrative, you're going to affect people. In, in my case, to, to really make an active choice to tell a, a gay love story that felt 
authentic to my own experience in a way that I hadn't seen depicted in television before. I think as anybody whose stories are kind of not at the forefront, you end up as an actor or, or you know, as a viewer, you end up watching yourself in a way kind of distilled into a version of what people want you to be or what ex network executives consider to be kind of a palatable version of who you are. And so for me, I think I, I was given a, an opportunity and I was given the freedom by, the, by both our networks in Canada and the US to tell whatever stories I wanted to tell. It was a conscious effort on my part to make sure that all the intricacies of, of the relationship that I was writing felt real and that you know, when I walked into the store that I owned with my boyfriend that we kissed as, as straight couples would kiss, and you realize in those moments that that isn't represented a lot on TV. You don't see casual intimacy between two men on television. And, you know, at, at first, it obviously kind of strikes you as like, I wonder how people are going to take this. I wonder how kind of middle America is going to perceive this. But the, the surprising thing was that I can probably count, and maybe I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not scouring the internet for, for <laughs> negativity, um, but I do feel like, you know, the positive outcome of this is that I could probably count on two hands the negative things that have been written, but the, the, sh the volume of letters and notes from people, be it kids who have seen themselves reflected ki uh, in, in our story or, or kids who have come out of the closet by using, you know, certain dialogue from our show or, or parents who have accepted their children in ways because they had been able to learn through the show. I think television is an incredibly powerful medium and I think in comedy in particular, people don't expect to necessarily be caught off guard by sentimentality or love. The freedom that a lot of new creators in TV are, have been allowed is, is the capacity to be funny and to also be emotional and to also tell stories that we don't get to see. So it's very exciting and I, you know, I have to say that it's quite thrilling to be in the company of everyone here because I do feel like the work that everyone has done has helped you know, move the dial for, for voices and for stories that we don't get to see all the time. Damn, that was very well said, Dan. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> I think it's true. I think people second guess the, the, the public too often. I think, as you say, the networks, they do say, can the, can the public take this when it's a tab taboo subject or something? And the answer is yes. Real life's much scarier than anything in fiction. And I, 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 I deal purposely in taboo subject for that reason, that I do want people to feel slightly uncomfortable when I start talking about it. There's no harm can come from discussing taboo subjects. That, you know, that's what stops them being taboo and it takes the audience to a place it hasn't been before and that's exciting in fiction and crea we create our own heroes and villains a sort of role play for the soul so they go through those emotions and they really cry and they get angry and they laugh and no one really gets hurt if you can't do it in fiction I mean that should always be the first point really trying stuff out um, so I, I think I think that's exactly right that People embrace something they haven't seen before, particularly if it's their story and they identify with it in some way. Yeah, I will say though, with taboo subjects, you know, it's it's obviously some of you guys talk about that stuff more than I do, but I think it's also important what the point of view or perspective on the taboo subject is. I think sometimes people just do shock to do shock, and I do think that that stuff can cause actual harm in the world. I really do. I think there are jokes against certain marginalized groups that can actually hurt. Um, so I think talking about taboo subjects is extremely, extremely uh, beneficial, but I do think that the point of view you take on them is also important. Of course. I, that's what I always say, is there anything you wouldn't joke about? I say, no, it depends on the joke. An offense often comes when people mistake the subject of a joke with the actual target. And that's really important. And that's a really important right. distinction to make. You want to do it intelligently and inclusively. <laughs> but um, right. I, I think some people are just terrified of a taboo subject. I often ask on Twitter, is there something I shouldn't talk about? And I get a I get hundred answers. And, and I can find a counterexample where you can, there isn't a subject you can't talk about or joke about. I think it speaks to the, the, the team, you know? I think to tell inclusive stories requires, you know, a, a writer's room that is uh, filled with people who have different stories to tell. So I think it really starts with how things are, are made and, um, 
and you know, being being quite young in this industry, and and I have learned tremendously, uh, you know, over the past six years, and and will definitely be bringing a lot of the the successes and the failures of of how to create that into whatever I do next, and and that to me is what's really exciting, and I think that's what. Um, this whole kind of conversation that we're in now is is going to, I hope, have such a positive effect on the content that is made from here on out because I think it has become necessary to make sure that voices are heard and that people are employed in positions of power where things don't slip through the cracks anymore because that's how we've gotten to be where we are, is one too many things have slipped through the cracks. And you know, apologies have happened kind of after the fact. And to be honest, it doesn't make that much of a difference because whatever was presented was presented. And that was, that was the impact. My, my problem is right. this is my writer's room here, and it's full. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, ve I'm very, very diverse inside. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, Diversity of thought, Ricky. All right, we were talking about the response of fans. Keenan, in your role at, at SNL, you are impersonating a whole slew of, of different people. How often do you hear from the people who you are impersonating? I mean, it, it depends on the person and how often I've done it. You know, like I heard from Steve Harvey and stuff like that and Big Poppy, but it's always usually pretty positive. I mean, Steve wasn't overly excited about it in the beginning. He grew to love it, I guess, because, you know, like I don't do it out of any malice. It's all out of, out of love, pretty much. I know him, so he, he told me, you know, in different ways, or, you know, he would say it on his radio show, and then people would call me and be like, hey, Steve Harvey talking about you this morning on the radio, and I'd be like, all right, well, I'm sure he'll settle down once he realizes that I'm not attacking him. But I remember I, we were kind of attacking Star Jones a little bit back in the day, and she was not <laughs> feeling that shit, so. <laughs> what do you do in, in those scenarios? I lay low, man. I lay low. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't feel like I'll run into Star Jones anywhere, so I just lay low for <laughs> stuff like that. But people like Steve, you know, I'm probably going to run into him somewhere, so I had to smooth that out. I went to <laughs> Chicago and did his talk show and stuff like that, so we're good. As, as the longest tenure... <laughs> Uh, cast member on SNL. When did you get comfortable with the idea that you would decide when you're, you know, ready to move on versus Lorne Michaels deciding for you? So put another way, uh, when in your tenure did you stop being nervous about getting fired? Yeah, I mean, I guess I wasn't worried about being fired after a couple of seasons just because you have to let that go and just kind of do the job. You know, if you're so focused on getting fired every single show, you can't focus on entertaining people. You've got to yeah. try and get fired. That's that's my advice. Try and get fired. Right, <laughs> right. And then you'll and you'll then probably it, be you'll be probably Ricky. Be that is terrible advice. You go the other way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> that's not good, good advice, advice, Ricky. <laughs> yeah. Try and get right. fired. You can do that if you're Ricky Gervais, but. <laughs> Somebody else gets their first job, they take your advice, they try and get fired. Guess what? They get fired. They get fucking fired. <laughs> That's how that next five. They, they get over it. They get over it. They thank me later. <laughs> I mean, I, I just also have to say, Keenan, you are so good on SNL. You're just so effortless. And there is so Thank much you. stress that goes into that job. I mean, it was, I, I've been to a couple tapings and just as an audience member, I'm stressed out. You yeah. just make it look so easy, and the, work, the character work that you do is so joyful. It kind of speaks for itself in terms of, of why you have not been fired. It is, uh, it is a skill set that just is magnificent to watch. Thank you, man. I, you know, I don't take praise well, but I, re I really appreciate <laughs> that. I've been very blessed, is all I could say. Just try to stay focused and, and, re and really try to figure out the formula of comedy. That's what I was telling Ricky earlier that I loved his special so much because he spent so much time talking about how to talk about, like going back to taboo subjects, but just showing the fact that anything can be talked about if you do it smartly. That's how I approach, you know, sketches or trying to push forward how, you know, black comedy, I guess, is, is perceived or progressing. So always just being very serious about the approach, basically. And one way to keep me calm in that is to make it joyful for me. You know what I mean? So that's why my energy is always big or I do big eyes and things like that. I just like a lot of 
big energy to kind of make it obvious that we're supposed to be having fun. One of your roles at SNL is also, if I'm not mistaken, you're still the uh, the the warm up guy, which which feels like it it would be the job that you sort of haze the new guy with. How did that become your role, and and what is the sort of power in that? I mean, it's it's a team effort basically. There's two stages of the warm up. Uh, there's a stand-up portion to welcome the audience, and then we sing a song, and it's, it's been this traditional thing since I've been there, you know, like somebody goes up and does the welcoming and tells everybody where the fire exits are, and then the cast will, like, sing a song with the band or whatever to get them in the mood, and it just landed on me because I was so excited to, like, jump into it, and I first did it with Fred Armisen and Taryn Killam, and we were all doing a song together, and then they both left the show, and then I was, like, left singing kind of by myself for like the last eight years. <laughs> and you will still be there eight years from now, I suspect. Yeah, that's right. It's all about the... <laughs> Kamel, I want to turn to you, you know, over the course of, of the run of, of Silicon Valley, your career, I, I think it's fair to say, has, has exploded. But I want to sort of talk about sort of this, this moment in time and, and the pressures that come with the, the choices that you make. I think, you know, I'm very, very aware of the window. I think a lot of uh, people in comedy, there's like a little bit of a window you get where you, you have your shot, right? And that goes away for a lot of people. So I think the best you can do is just go with your gut and do stuff that you can be proud of. But trying to just sort of do stuff that I like, because, you know, you, when you try and guess what the audience wants to see that's a losing game there's no way to do that if you look at someone like Ricky you know who's had such a long career going from sort of a successful thing to successful thing to successful thing and what I think he's done a great job of is having a point of view with everything he does everything he does feels like it comes from from uh, Ricky Gervais so try and do that you know figure out a little bit what your voice is and try and do stuff that excites you. One of those things was being a superhero, being a part of the Marvel superhero family, and there's a first in, in that. How significant was that for you, and, and what kind of sort of weight comes with it? Well, it was very significant for me because it was something I really, really personally wanted to do. I'm a big like fan of sci-fi, big fan of superheroes, big fan of Marvel movies, so I really, really wanted to do that. Now, on top of that, there's this other pressure that comes in that I'm the first South Asian superhero, in a major Hollywood movie, in a Marvel movie, I'm the first Pakistani superhero, but then that stuff, it's a little harder to negotiate because I can only represent myself. I can't represent the millions and millions of people. So, so I do feel that pressure, but I think the only way to, to, re to relieve that pressure is just to have more people have these opportunities. You know, it's not, I, one person cannot represent a whole group of people because, you know, there's just all our experiences and backgrounds are completely different. That said, for me, when I got that part, I want to look like someone who could take on sort of the traditional Hollywood looking superhero. So I wanted to look like someone who could take on Thor, who could take on Captain America. To me, that was an important part because I was the first Pakistani superhero. Like, so you had to get jacked for your culture? Like you did it, you did it for Yeah, Islam I did it for all my people, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. doing reps for Pakistan. You have to get ripped for it. That's the newest ice bucket yeah. challenge. Rip for yeah, Pakistan. Yeah, all of Pakistan can now yeah. eat, eat cake and sit on a couch because I'm out here doing pull-ups. <laughs> it's obviously quite a, quite a leap from your character on, on Silicon Valley, which is one that alongside all of these different moves you've gone back to each each season. What is that sort of tonal shift I would say um, I sort of obviously you know the movie's not out so nobody knows this character yet but I approached him really as a as as the opposite of the opportunities that I'd gotten and the opposite of the opportunities that I've seen a lot of other brown men get traditionally in Hollywood you know so I feel like we're this we're this group where we can be the model minority so we can be like the smart nerds or the exact opposite. We could be terrorists, you know, depending on what the project is. I think those are like <laughs> the sort two of two uh, ends of the spectrum that we occupy and very little in between. So I wanted him to be in opposition to everything. So, you know, I've gotten to play a nerd. I wanted this guy to be cool. I played weaklings. I wanted this guy to be strong. Uh, uh, you know, people, uh, brown men have to play terrorists sometimes. I wanted him to be 
the opposite. I want him to be full of joy. So really, uh, this character for me was, was defined by what I didn't want him to be, and that was based on a lot of the things that I'd seen uh, brown men playing on TV and movies. We're going we're gonna to touch very quickly on the photo <laughs> that broke the internet. I guess the first place to start is what surprised you most about the sort of response to it? Just that my aunts saying they were really proud of me. did not <laughs> expect that. Um, it's not something I'd expect. <laughs> Listen, it got so much bigger than I thought it was going to get. I had no idea that it was going to that it was going to be like that. If I'd known it was going to be like that, I probably wouldn't have done it because I still, I'll tell you, I've come to hate that picture. <laughs> you have? Why? I just, you know, it's weird. You sort of get a weird body dysmorphia when, when the whole world is concentrating on how you look. And listen, I'm very, very grateful. And I put those pictures out for a reason, right? I did that because I wanted that reaction, obviously. But then when you get that reaction, it's a little weird where you're like, people are really judging little bits of your physical being. And I know a lot of people have it a lot worse than me, but it sort of makes you feel kind of naked. I got, I became shallow. I got obsessed with how I look. And then all I would see are sort of what I perceive as flaws. Hmm. That happened to me. Uh, people judge me because of my body a lot. <laughs> and I'm trying to turn that around. And uh, I'm, I, have, I probably haven't How's been to the gym in 35 years just to try and, <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to, I want people to love me for my mind. You got in shape, didn't you, Ricky? Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Did I? I remember, <laughs> I remember I? the first time I heard about Ricky with, with the, actually Ricky with the, with the original office. Everyone said this really hot guy who works at an office. That was all I kept hearing. <laughs> <laughs> that was the word I was yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I've had liposuction, but only, so I've had a lot of liposuction, but only in my testicles because they had, uh, it's where I put all my fat. So I just had enormous yeah. balls, and I've had them, I've had that, them that leaked. That picture would break the internet for sure. <laughs> that is not where I anticipated that going. I, that's, I did. You did. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Shame on yeah, me. Yeah, I was like, when is he going to talk about his fat balls again? <laughs> what would the rest of you guys be willing to make that kind of sacrifice for? Is there a role that, that you would sort of put yourself through what, what Kumail did? I probably, like... It's funny, I like joked about being James Bond and then like, I can't really say anything, but like it's, it's weird, it's kind of kind of become a thing and so I've been thinking about it, yeah. I can't say much, but yeah, there, there's, uh, yeah. What do you mean cool. you can't say much? What does that mean? I just, not, not my agent will get really frustrated, but yeah, no, it like, yeah. I need to say more things, I think, about things that I want. <laughs> and then they'll arrive at your door? Yeah, put it out there, man. Put yeah. it in the universe. I'll put it out there. I, I remember first getting to Los Angeles and going and doing a general at CW. <laughs> and, you know, um, you're walking down the halls and it's just six packs and six packs and six packs and, si and like models. And you get finally get to the end. <laughs> and I was like fresh from Toronto, like had no experience and walked into the room and had, a, I think the meeting was about two and a half minutes long. She just was like, okay, thanks. Thanks for coming in. Great to meet you. Bye-bye. Never, never got a CW audition after that. Mm, yeah. I don't think that's my hit. Like, I don't think that's my <laughs> niche. I don't think that's, that's what I was intended to do. And Ricky, what, what's the sort of part you'd love to play if only it were being offered? Astronaut. Astronaut just lying down, <laughs> floating around. You can't see it's me, so I could have a double there most of the time. Uh, <laughs> you, you urinate in your suit. For you, urinating in your clothes is one of the positives of being an athlete. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. I'd have to get, yeah. I'd, I'd love that. I, I'm great. looking forward to that. Ricky. I, you don't uh, yeah. have to go to space to pee your pants. No, it's not. It's no, just, I know. It's the only. But, but, I'd, be, but I'd, I'd be getting paid for it, wouldn't I? Why do you think <laughs> I do this? Yeah. To get it's up, the only to make money. they can carry his balls. Yeah. If I could, if, if a role could be, remember that thing phone booth, when it was, what was his name? Was it Kiefer Sutherland just that sat on the bottom of a phone booth for the entire shoot? I thought I was jealous. I thought what a great shoot that was. Just sitting in the bottom of a phone, phone booth. Um, so yeah, I, well the first time I filmed something, um, I, I didn't know about filming, but like uh, if, if, um, if uh, you're sitting down and the doorbell goes and you have to get up, open the door, 
uh, you soon realise that that takes all day to shoot that. So now I change the line. I just go, I just stay, I say, come in. Anything that I don't want to do, anything <laughs> that I don't want to, ha hair and makeup, wigs, anything that I, I, I make sure my characters wear all the clothes I've got anyway. It, just comfort, <laughs> sitting down, anything sitting down, comfortable. Uh, Ironside, oh, Ironside would be good. I'd also make sure that chair was a toilet. Obviously, <laughs> so I I do that <laughs> remake of Iron Sight. <laughs> I, mean, I, I want to go back to you. You just talked about the sort of the, the two buckets of, of jobs. The sort of terrorist job, which I know is 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 one that you've sort of resisted. The other one was the the bucket in which you know Dinesh, your, your character from Silicon Valley, fell into. What was the sort of thought process in in taking that role all those years ago? And and did you worry about the sort of t tight casting that could come with it? Not really for that specific show, because even though I'm a nerd, everybody's a nerd. That's a show about <laughs> nerds, right? If I was the only brown guy on the show and I was the only nerd, that would be one thing. But that is a show about <laughs> nerds. And I was just such a fan of Mike Judge. I mean, everything he does is so, so good that for me, I knew that that character was going to be specific enough that it wasn't going to fall into the stereotypical roles that I'd been that I've been talking about. So, no, for me. Easiest job I've ever said yes to is Silicon Valley. Rami, one of the things you've talked about with, with your show is that you hoped it would sort of start conversations. What kinds of conversations has it started for, for you and, and, and your family and your sort of close circle? I think so much of what we've looked at in the show is kind of a conversation of, uh, of a millennial who uh, has faith. Which, which just feels like a thing that's super contradictory. I think in general, religion's basically just like a punchline in comedy. And I think for us to kind of find what's funny within it, while it's still being a genuine thing, as it is to a lot of people who are trying to figure out the nooks and crannies of like, well, how do I hold on to what I believe in and also react to what I'm feeling and seeing in the present moment. And so I think on a community level, it's really interesting just for the various Muslim communities to not only look at this story and feel relatability, but also be challenged on certain things. I mean, one of the things we looked at uh, in, in season two, we were really lucky we got Mahershala Ali to play my sheikh. And it, it was an exciting thing for the show because you have this Arab Muslim family. And then suddenly as a show, we get to look at anti-blackness within the Arab community. We get to look at what I think is a, a type of racism that we don't really talk about, which is there's this umbrella of people of color, but underneath it, uh, there's still a lot of anti-blackness. And so to be able to break that down on a show like ours, while also looking at things that people care about, I make my show for people who resonate with it to watch. Like, I don't think, like sometimes people think like, oh man, you put a Muslim family on TV and now the South are gonna understand Muslims and I'm like I don't they don't the South isn't watching Hulu like I don't think they care this isn't about that this isn't about swing voters it's not about bringing people over this is about people who are invested in these themes also need to be challenged on what they think they think they know and so that's what's interesting to me it's not about bringing in other people it's really about we're all in the same room but we can't just be echoing the same conversations we need to dig into them in a, in a more meaningful way I was just going to say what Rami brings up is a very good point. Sometimes I feel like there's these two buckets, right? There's like white people and then everyone else is people of color. There's this idea that there's like a monolith monolithic thought in there. But as, as he was saying about sort of the anti-African, anti-black anti sentiment among some of the other uh, people of color, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's not talked about that much. And it's, and it's Yeah, and what and exactly is this anti-black sentiment? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we we saw yeah. this scene on, on my show. We actually, so it's all it oh, was a thing, it. and now it's okay, not. Okay, cool. So, long as it's fixed, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to make sure it was fixed before we met because I was like, we're about to be on a Zoom, and I just want to make sure we yeah. can take care of it and, and before we should, you know, we should pick up we should pick up sides, shouldn't we? Sort of like divide right? the world three on three. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question, um, Rami. I get kind of similar questions in terms of the impact that you, some of the stories that you tell will have on kind of middle America. I mean, I certainly never um, thought about the, the impact of the show. That wasn't my intention when we sat down to tell these stories. So I guess like my question to you is, mm. was there anything in, in the early stages of putting your show together that you had to push back against because of 
what I, I would imagine a, a studio or something mm. would see as kind of marketability. You're constantly fighting for specificity. Like you're constantly fighting for the ability to not over explain. And I think my whole argument was always, look, this is a show called Rami. Half the people don't know how to pronounce my name. 99% of them don't know who I am. We're talking about Arab Muslims on Hulu. You're not getting the, the middle. This isn't like a middle America pull per se. It'll only be that if the show is really good, not based on anything else. And the only way for it to be really good is to be really specific. But I, I really bump against this idea that comedy is changing things. I think it can emotionally put people in a little bit of a, a place where they can be a little more open, but we're seeing the real change in the way people are out there doing things. That's amazing. You see the people who hit the streets, you see Black Lives Matter, you see these infrastructures that have been put in place. Black Lives Matter started seven, eight years ago. It's just now becoming a thing, right? These are real things of change. I don't I think thinking that comedy changes stuff is just delusional with the media landscape because people curate their own experience. People can watch whatever videos they want that convince them coronavirus isn't even real. So why, like, it's not Cosby. There's not five, six channels and you have to learn and meet the Cosbys. Like, no, you pick whatever you want and, and, and you believe that. And so it's our job that I have to look at my show being like, okay, who's gonna naturally be inclined to watch this? And how do I challenge that person's thought? Because there's still a lack of diversity of thought, regardless of what side you're on. I, th I, th I, th I think we all aspire to being like Bill Cosby, um, but I think that's a very good, very good point. It doesn't really change anything, and I think people fear that they they really do think that an attitude, a, a laughing at a joke. What what really annoys me is that um, people think that a joke is the window to the comedian's true soul. And it's just not true. Uh, a, a, a big part of my comedy is saying things I do not mean. I, I, I say the wrong thing because I know the audience knows the right thing and that's why they laugh. Um, it, it's, it's ludicrous. I'll I, I change the joke halfway through. I'll pretend to be right wing, left wing, no wing if it makes the joke funnier. And that, I, I think your point is, is great. The people that think People are sitting at home thinking, I'm going to change the world with this gag are really, they're really delusional. Well, Ricky, can I ask you something uh, about something you just touched on? I think it's interesting. You said sometimes you say jokes um, that obviously are not what you mean. How do you feel about audiences that might watch it and think, oh, that's how, that is how Ricky feels. That is his true point of view. Well, it's an occupational hazard because there's only so much you can wink and let you know the audience know that you don't mean it and you ruin the satire and the irony. That's what satire and irony is. And to a certain extent, you've got to aim at people who get it. And sometimes they're, they're clever people. The fact that there's, uh, if I play to 15,000 people, there are going to be rapists, paedophiles, murderers, <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to, you know... They, coming like, to see your you show, can't, like, Ricky. <laughs> yeah. What is your demo? They're, they're my, <laughs> but do you know what I mean? To think that someone might not get that joke, I think that's, that's a worrying state of mind because someone somewhere is not going to get your joke because some people are stupid. You, you, uh, there, there comes to a point where you go, listen, the joke's there, the joke's gettable, most people get it. If there's one person that doesn't get it, I, I can live with that. Uh, with it, in character comedy, that's the other thing that people don't realise is that even in stand-up, there's a bit of character, there's a bit of persona. I often play the person who's saying the wrong thing, and then I say the right thing. And the audience, we hope, are clever enough to know when I'm being serious and when I'm not. That's the that's the exciting bit that they feel clever when they get it. That someone might take you at face value doing an ironic joke or satirical joke. Well. Yeah, some people, some people try to inject themselves with bleach, but I, I, you know, I don't know, I, I don't know what to say really. There, there are stupid people in the world. There's no one ever that was in court and the judge said, um, and why did you rape this person? And they say, I heard a joke about it and I assumed it was legal. <laughs> that's never, that's never happened, right? That person's already a maniac. No one, no one is going away, not getting jokes and doing terrible things. I, I, I don't buy it.
No, but I mean specifically you used rape as an example, but there are other examples like, you know, for instance, if there's a joke about another marginalized group of people and you're, you're on, and I'm not talking specifically about you, I'm just having this conversation. If you're sure. making some sort of joke where obviously you don't believe it, but the point of the view of the joke is that it's good that these people are marginalized. Well, I do think that that can affect, um, no, it can normalize ideas that would other, otherwise societally be considered harmful. Now, we're, we're, we're assuming we've established that it depends on the joke and it depends on the, the target. And, uh, uh, and, and, I think, and I think that's right. I just, uh, I tell jokes about race without them being racist. Now, some people will think if they haven't heard the joke right or understood it or didn't get the irony, they may well think that's a racist joke, but it's not. And there's, there's nothing more I can say, really. The, the, the experience I've had is when you talk about issues and marginalised groups, that is a way forward. You, you, I don't think you're allowed to say, um, we want to be treated just like everyone else, except in jokes. But apart from that, we want to be treated exactly like... Every, it, but not, we don't want to be the subject of humour. That's what, that's what right. I was saying about taboo subjects. You know, I, I'm... But I, I still come back to it depends on the joke. You know, there's no carte blanche. There's no, I, right. I'm not one of these people that thinks comedy is, is your conscience taking a day off. My conscience never takes a day off. I can justify every joke I've done. Whether people believe me or care or, uh, or agree with me, that's not my problem once it's out there. But I never let my conscience take a day off. Uh, it's just that some people don't get it, don't like it, don't agree with it. That's life. Dan, I'm going to turn back to you. The question you were asking, Rami, was interesting. And I'm curious, one of, the, one of the choices that you made on Schitt's Creek was to sort of show a widespread acceptance on the show. There is not a whiff of homophobia on, on your show. Why was that so important to you? For us, it was making sure that the, the town of Schitt's Creek, which I think, traditionally speaking, small towns in comedies have always kind of been the butt of the joke. They've been reduced to kind of you know, cartoon characters. And it was really important for us that this town be the kind of epicenter for growth for our family. And it's ultimately a satire on wealth and indulgence and what love kind of means. So having the ability to say, I am not going to have bigotry or, or homophobia ever discussed on our show, it's a way of kind of projecting a world that I felt was kind of gentler and more accepting and saying, here, <laughs> This is mm -hmm. making people feel good, and this is bringing out the best in people. Wouldn't it be nice if this was, if we kind of reflected on this? It wasn't even that intellectual at the time, but it was just kind of a reaction to, if I were to include homophobia or bigotry of any kind in the show, it's giving power to those people who see themselves on TV. That's just for the case of my particular show. I think particularly for, for gay characters, we have, come to expect any time we fall in love on camera to end in death <laughs> or end in something terrible or tragic or to never be given like happiness completely. But for us, I wanted to take the space to create a love story where you didn't have to fear for the safety and security of these two people who were falling in love and that inherently the support of this community is what made them fall in love and what actually lifted the whole sort of group as a whole. One of the, the other things that you've, you've talked about but that you sort of struggled with this idea of being the son of a, of a legend, when you were sort of coming up and, and you would do school plays and he would say, can I help you, and, and your response was, was no. Curious sort of what yeah. was at the root of that and how ultimately did you come to a place where it was, hey dad, let's create and co-star in a show together? I think we can all sort of admit family members of successful actors or producers or directors are kind of viewed through a lens of the snap judgment, I think, generally speaking, is nepotism or that they've been allowed some sort of in. I think for me being young and, and just like, you know, being raised in, in socially where people knew who, what, who my dad was and you know going to, to camp and having people sort of write letters saying the only reason people are friends with you is because you have a famous father. It, it kind of conditions you to want to create something on your own because you are so aware of the connection and you are so aware of 
the fact that people are, are going to initially write you off as being someone who has been afforded a luxury that other people haven't ha you know, had access to just by you know, who you are. My dad doesn't care about the entertainment industry. He, he doesn't <laughs> watch entertainment news. He doesn't care about celebrity. He likes eating bagels, and that's his vibe. Um, but for me, growing up, I wanted to create something for my own peace of mind and to really distance myself on all areas of, of, of the entertainment kind of inklings that I was getting just so that I could see for myself, do I even have something that is worthy of, of taking it to the next level and do I have a, a, a skill set that I feel confident enough to move forward with? And that only, I could only do that without his help because if he did help, then I would always be questioning, was it something that he helped me with or was it something that I did on my own? And I think being a host on MTV for eight years and the majority of those years, I didn't tell people who my father was. I was able to carve a space for myself where I could experiment and I could write sketches and I could do you know, and interviews and, and really explore what I had to offer in a way that was unobstructed by the presumption that I had gotten the job through my dad. And then when I moved out to uh, Los Angeles, I, I brought an idea to him that I felt confident and comfortable enough to say, I know that I'm going to bring something to the table here and I know that I have something to say. And I thought mm -hmm. his warmth and his kind of comedic softness in a way could really lend itself to making a special tone to, the, to, to what this show could be. So um, I only came to him many, many, many years later with, with the confidence that I didn't have before. Keenan, I, I wanna turn to you. This is obviously a, a world that you've been a part of since you were a child. What, what has been the sort of navigation process? Is there a, a career uh, that you look at that is a sort of a role model and, and that you're taking cues from? Yeah, Bill Cosby, right? <laughs> Uh, Rick, Rick was pointing at himself. <laughs> Imagine Keenan grew up <laughs> just <laughs> looking at Ricky's career. That's wild. <laughs> um, up until recently, it, it was, you know, Bill Cosby, you know, up until like all the allegations and things we learned about him. I admired, you know, his sense of humor. I watched Bill Cosby himself, you know, a million times. He was my first window into comedy, basically, because he was the clean one at first. And then I got to look back on you know, Eddie as I grew up and Richard as I grew up and George Carlin and then Jim Carrey came along and all these people and like, you know, I just modeled, yeah, I watched everybody who, you know, was a great stand up and then got their chance. I was already like 15 when I got my first job, so I wasn't like a kid, kid, kid. I kind of you know, was pretty young. established as, yeah, I, but you know, I had my morals and things like that and, you know, I'm like family close and and that's how I kept it. You, you brought up uh, Cosby, but I imagine, was it sort of hard to reconcile when all of a sudden he wasn't allowed to be your hero? Not at all. I mean, it was, you know, definitely like a bummer, but I, I couldn't imagine how much of a bummer it is for actual, his actual victims, you know what I'm saying? So it was a harsh wake up call into the reality that everybody is human at the end of the day. Like even your, your heroes that you assume couldn't possibly be, you know, a certain kind of way, but that was incredibly shocking and disappointing and all of that, so. All right, we're, we're going to uh, end on a more of a, a sort of lightning round. The first one, what's your favorite comedic performance of all time? I'll, I'll start, Jim Carrey, Cable Guy. Jim Carrey, Cable Guy, I like it. I'm out. I'll go with either Bill Murray in Ghostbusters or Bill Murray in Groundhog Day. Um, Ghostbusters because there's all these stakes it's really scary but he's really funny in it without <laughs> puncturing the stakes and to me that's like the ultimate challenge of all action comedy is how do you mm. be funny without making it feel like you're making fun of what's happening and he really I mean he really treads that line so well I'm gonna go with Ricky Gervais on this zoom chat just like the <laughs> levity and the, and just there were times where he was serious and he like really brought it into the heart but then there were times where he's just funny he's just riffing and he's loose and just yeah it was just like this level of nuance that oh, we gotta uh, switch yeah. it up that's that's three for the whites we gotta switch it up come on Dan yeah. come on Ricky they're gonna come cut on, all Dan. that you're gonna look stupid because they're gonna cut all my stuff for me, one of the highlights was his dad <laughs> spilling milk on his face when he's going yeah. in and out of the a train tunnel. A little bit tunnel. surreal. Yeah, and you're like, Whoa, that was such a roller coaster. Right. I was like, oh, okay. wow, what a stress dream. And then yeah. that was a lie. So he was lying about a dream. So he was already lying about something that we knew wasn't real. So I would say, for yeah. me, that really brought it home. I'd say 
it was probably me in the office. No, um, I'd, uh, <laughs> I'd uh, probably Laurel and, and Hardy in, um, in uh, County Hospital. To me, it's like scenes. Okay, give me one scene. Okay, so I'll give a few. Uh, Lucille Ball oh. with the chocolates. I know, I'm switching <laughs> the rules here. I would say Eddie Murphy crossing a highway is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Both and then you? I would say Catherine O'Hara in For Your Consideration, one of the most underrated comedic performances I've, I've seen in a very, very long time. With the fight. And Ricky, um, and Ricky in the film. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But when she did that, she did a full face of cosmetic surgery that Amazing. was just her face. Yeah, there, yeah. Was, there was no yeah, yeah, yeah. prosthetics. That was just her holding yeah. a face of toit plastic surgery for an entire third of a film. It was quite, uh, it was quite extraordinary, but yeah. I'd like to mention someone who isn't here, who's very, very current, and that's Larry David in the last series of Curb. I think it's, I think it's amazing. For modern times, the last, uh, it's one of the greatest writer performers, I think, of the last 25 years. So I think we should give him a mention. Christopher Guest in Spinal Tap. Oh, play it again, Sam. Woody Allen, play it again, Sam. Come on. Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor, Long Beach. Richard Pryor, Pat Patrice, Patrice O'Neill, uh, uh, Louis yeah. C.K. chewed up. Come on, there's no, oh, he up. can't. It's impossible. Louis C.K. and, and Woody, I, uh... and Bill Cosby, Bill Cosby, <laughs> <laughs> Bill Cosby. It all comes back to Leonard Bill Cosby. the Sixth. Bill Cosby and Leonard the Sixth. Kevin, Sp Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Spacey. Are we forgetting Kevin Spacey? Oh God! Um, come on, come on. Uh, well, I can't leave Kevin come Spacey. Come on. Now. Harvey Weinstein. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh gosh, all right. If you could have complete and utter anonymity back for a day, what's the first thing you do? That's assuming that, that I'm not kind of anonymous walking down the street. I think that question Dan and is I are geared good. toward very famous people. <laughs> I Dan, Dan and I stand on corners trying to get some sort of a, we're, we're fine. Yeah, yeah. We, we got, we, yeah, we're, we're good. Keenan. That question's I, for Keenan. I live, no, I mean, I live pretty normal. People like, people say hi and everything, but nobody's trying to like rip my clothes off. You know what I'm saying? So like, it's always just like hand by. So I, I live pretty like every day. So I'm trying to think like, I don't, nobody yeah. even really bothers me like that. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah, people tell me they really like the last season of Patriot Act. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> How do you respond? Thank you. I worked really hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing and sad. All right, last one. If you could switch careers with anyone else in Hollywood for a day, who would you choose? Just the one day? David Geffen? <laughs> this is a pretty tricky question because tomorrow that person could be just dragged to hell. So I know. Could I just say, guys, if you want to choose me, I've... N I've I've never assaulted anyone. I'm not a pedophile. I've never assaulted anyone, so I'm I'm safe. You could choose me, and you won't be you won't be disappointed. For me, it'd be it would be Oprah, just just for the influence, but also the ability to like legitimately act, but then also do the talk show thing. Just true versatility and power. Can I also say Oprah, or is that is that answer stale at this point? No, you should. You should. Okay. You say Gail. I'm gonna go with Oprah say Gail. as well. That's. That Montecito house is, is that farmland that she is. It's Those one, baskets one of are many. just produce. All right, Ricky, who are you choosing? Oh, I don't know. I don't want to do anything. Who sits around just eating all day? Guy Fieri <laughs> eats a lot all day. Diners drives in, <laughs> drive ins and dives. You could put a little blonde wig this, on this... and be Guy Fieri. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're already Guy Fieri, you wouldn't also need to put a blonde wig on. The thing is that we become that person, right? Is it like Quantum Leap when we bec we look in the mirror and we're suddenly Tom Cruise, and then we act weird? We've still got we remember it all, do we? We're That's us. Right. I'm yes. taking this very seriously. Uh, who would I choose then? Oh, this is tricky. Just take your um, time. Yeah, no, we got nothing but time here, Ricky. <laughs> this isn't real. It's no, they're not gonna. Hold I just would hate this. for you to rush and say something that you feel uncomfortable with later. The kind of regret you would feel. America's waiting for your answer. Oh, I don't know. Do I? Who's the fat? Who's the fattest person in, in the world? I mean. All right. Thank you guys all for for being part of this conversation. I appreciate you uh, all being here, albeit virtually, and hopefully we'll all get to be together at an actual table sometime soon. Uh, it's our pleasure. Good luck, editors. 
Hey, good to meet all you guys. <laughs> <laughs>